hey, I'm Lerp, it's like played Counter-Strike for a living for eight years. I've been on the desk for some of the biggest events for five years. I know nothing about Counter-Strike, but then again, neither does Thorin. Welcome to his YouTube channel. When I use the phrase hype train, I actually like to refer to a definition of the word hype that the legendary showman, entertainer, and mixed martial artist Chael Sonnen used because he was someone famous for trash talking, building up a fight, being able to sell a fight and make people excited about it, even though famously his style was kind of a like lay on your wrestling ground and pound aspect that people generally don't enjoy as much in MMA. And what he said was he didn't think of himself as someone who hyped fights because he considered hype to be where you artificially create excitement for a fight where it's fake. There's, it's not something real. Now, what he would claim is he was just using like clever angles on something or exaggerating a concept. So the, the point I'm getting to here is hype train to me is usually actually something which it's not really legitimate. Like, you know, you're just getting overly excited about one run that a team had, or you're just hoping they can be as good as they were at this one tournament or even better than they were there, where it's not really like legitimate. If it's actually legitimate, it's no longer a hype trip for my money. So one of the reasons why I love the open circuit that Dota 2 and CSGO has is precisely because the open circuit is the main enemy of any kind of a hype train. If you are not legitimate, if you had a one-off good run, if you had a nice bracket draw that got you easy opponents, or you got one nice upset that you probably wouldn't get next time, and so you end up placing much higher, the open circuit is going to be the person that takes care of you. It's not going to actually, even though, yes, people are going to come along and give context to your performance and rate that you probably had a higher performance than expected, actually just playing out more tournaments is going to yield the result if you weren't legitimate that you weren't legitimate like you'll have lower placings after that now why this is significant is you look at something like the overwatch league you look at something like the lcs you look at the league of legends championship circuit in general including worlds and because these are long drawn out and there's only a few key instances of a final result the end of the lcs split the end of the gauntlet the end of msi the end of the world championship as a result before that you you don't really get the kind of conclusive results that people consider when they're looking at trends and when they want to say how good a team is. No one's really remembering, oh, but remember how good that team was in week four of the NALCS back in season four. No one remembers that shit. They just remember if you won or lost the overall split. So what should have been 10 different storylines get condensed down into one final storyline that's retroactively applied to everything. And that's the only way people remember it. And so the worst thing is when you get an upset, when you get a hype train that gets going and it would have only lasted for one tournament because one tournament now is three months or there's only two of them or three of them in a year. People end up taking those as gospel. I mean, it would be the equivalent of legitimately telling people in 2007 that the best team in the NFL must have been the New York Giants because they won the Super Bowl, even though they weren't even one of the best teams going into the playoffs. I, a number of their results in the playoffs were upsets. The winning in the, in, in the Super Bowl was a massive upset, and the team they beat in the Super Bowl, I think most people, the majority of experts and players would say, was the best team that season, the Patriots, and in fact, one of the best teams of all time, even though they indeed did not win the Super Bowl. So when these results happen in games that don't have an open circuit, people can not only refer to these one-off results, as if they were just an accurate representation of who that team is overall and how good they were, but they can do so for months or even years. Like when North America for once outplaced Europe at the League of Legends World Championship, it was in season four World Championship, and all they did is get to the next round, and one of them was as a result of of a massive upset of a European team losing in a crazy fashion, and the other one was a lucky group draw. North America bragged about this for literally the entire next year until the next Worlds. So one year people had to hear this garbage because there was no extra chance to show that it wasn't the case. This year, with Cloud9 making the semi-finals, people will probably talk about that for years to come. People will make out like it's NA did good, even though actually only one NA team made the playoffs. Then you look at I mean, think about some of the teams that win the LCS. Like, not only do they get to carry that until the whole next year, until the end of the next split, but sometimes you have scenarios like this year in the LCS, a team called 100 Thieves 
the team that was had that CSGO team that was going to be the Brazilians, but pulled out in, in League of Legends. Their team was the second best in the spring split, made a couple of key changes, made them not as good in the summer split. But until they actually went out in the summer split, people still acted as though they were still the same team or, you know, because they came second in the other one, like they're still going to be extremely strong now, even though by the end of the split, they were a joke. Now, that's because, again, there wasn't enough key points in between then for people to make a decision and to notice that they weren't actually as good as they had been months prior. CSGO, we don't have this problem at all. First of all, we have majors, and yes, the major results can be big, but what's great is you've already seen with two of the last three major winners, Gambit at PGL Krakow 2017, and obviously this year, Cloud9 at the Boston Major, the E-League Boston Major, you've already seen that you didn't have to wait six months, three months to find out that these teams weren't legit. What happened was you get a large data sample size from before the major, from after the major. The major itself doesn't get like months and months off after it. So you get these teams tested. You get other teams who, if you're an underdog and you have a big result, now they focus on you. Now they do some research on you because they've seen you've got a big result or you've beaten someone they actually consider legit. Teams will spend time figuring out your map pool from online play, from all your other results, from trying to figure out what their strengths are. They will exploit the map pool against you. Teams have actually played against you, so they have a sense from direct feeling of what your resistance is like in the server and what you do there and what their intuitive feel for how you're playing the game with, as well as then studying the demo and breaking down exactly what you did, but from a, a, a scenario where they know what they were doing and what they were capable of, so they can now gauge better how to beat you, how to play against you, how to neutralize some of your strengths or emphasize their own strengths. There's also, beyond even just that, the intangible of, there's no more spotlight on you. There's more pressure on you. You've got something to lose now. You come on with expectations where before maybe you were an underdog team or a less uh, favored team or just a dark horse who people didn't think would win the championship. I mean, you look at some of the recent results and these are great examples of how hype trains that could have lasted months got very quickly killed. And I don't think that's a bad thing, personally. I really appreciate it. So let's think of the major. We're obviously, especially in the olden days, finishing top eight at a major was a very prestigious accomplishment. Well, maybe very exaggerated. It was a prestigious accomplishment. It was important because it got you into the next major, definitely. And obviously, it made people feel as though you were a team on the rise, a team that was capable of things. Well, let's look at three of the teams that placed top eight at the last major and got that legend state. So we've got Complexity from North America, Hellraisers from CIS slash Europe, and we've got Big from Germany primarily, but obviously they have a UK player as well. All three teams made top eight at the last major, but you didn't have to wait long to very quickly find out those results were either fortuitous performances, slight performances, or even big overperformances. So Complexity's top eight of the major looked like one of the most impressive because they were 3 0 in all of the stages. They even beat out some quality teams. Now, they got absolutely dusted off in the playoffs, but then you thought, well, you know, nerves, like a bunch of them have never been. In fact, all of them have never been in a playoff scenario where they've been in the major this is understandable as to why this might be. Well, right afterwards, you had ESL New York. And at ESL New York, they had a tournament. It was called something like the MSI Arena. And it was a best of one double limb tournament. And Complexity played against Avanga, the team with mainly Kazakhstani players and a Russian player. And the Avanga is a team that, okay, they've been in majors in the past, but they're not a top team. They've never done anything notable on LAN. Well, in this tournament, they were able to beat Complexity on Undusty, a map that one of the maps Complexity was playing. Then Complexity went to Starladder Season 6. They did not even manage to make the playoffs. They went 0-3. and three. They were absolute disappointment. Then you had Hellraisers, so Hellraisers made top 8. Right after that, they went to Starladder themselves. They also failed to make the playoffs. They also had a very woeful result. Right after that, they went to Epicenter. They should have been one of the teams that had a real capability to do some damage. They couldn't really put up any sort of a fight in their group. They weren't really a significant kind of player at the tournament. Again, they showed that they weren't some team burgeoning upon becoming very good. Then you had Big, so Big had their top eight. Obviously, the past, they'd already had a legit result with the Cologne run, but then they went to Starladder. They made the playoffs and they went out in the quarterfinals. Yeah, they lost to the winner, but the winner was a dark horse. Hence, that wasn't even a top three, top four team at the tournament. So Big ended up actually... In fact, the only map they won against Ents was even somewhat, you might say, fortuitous. Like, Ents looked in control that map the whole time. They didn't even make top four, didn't make the final. They didn't win the tournament. They're a tournament where they were considered one of the bigger names, a top three, top four name themselves. Then they went to CS Summit, a tournament that had even less top teams than Starladder. 
They weren't able to make the final of this tournament. They weren't able to win this tournament. They finished in third place. They lost to Optic. They lost to NRG. These were results that showed that they were not a team that actually had like elite quality. They've had some good results and they've had a couple of good placings. Then they went to IM Chicago. IM Chicago contained a very good result. They beat Na'Vi in a best of three. Didn't matter. They still went out in the next round. They still went out ninth to twelfth at the tournament. Didn't make a deep run overall and were not a, a, a significant team. So these runs afterwards really helped balance it out. Then let's look at some of the teams that didn't have major success, but likewise got evened out by the tournament circuit. So the very same Ents that won Star Series looked like a well-rounded team, looked like a squad that could do things. They didn't get the same production out of their players when they went to Epicenter, and so they couldn't make any kind of an impact. They couldn't upset a FaZe Clan that had just swapped out their in-game leader. They couldn't upset a Na'Vi that had just finished outside of the playoffs at ESL New York. These were results that it should have been right there for them to potentially cause a big upset and continue on their form and continue it at a higher level and shows it wasn't just a low-level result that they could do it against slightly better opposition. Couldn't do it. They're very same a Vanguard that upset complexity. Okay, let's not let them get too crazy off upset and complexity because they went to Epicenter and you know what? At Epicenter, they did it again. This time when they managed to beat NIP in a best of three. They managed to actually play Team Liquid decently on a map. They showed some decent performances. They even had some nice rounds against Na'Vi in the semifinals. But they went to IAM Chicago and there was nothing relevant whatsoever about their performance there. Outside of CIS region, they looked like their game entirely disappeared, even though they had that win over complexity here in the year. Now, all of a sudden, as good as those best of threes were, I am Chicago makes think, ah, maybe that was just a good couple of days. Maybe people haven't studied a Vanguard enough. Maybe they had some overperformance from people like Jim, who didn't perform in Chicago. Then finally, let's talk about a team that's a very good team, the best of all the teams I'm referencing here, but they've also showcased this, which is NRG. So NRG didn't even make it to the major. Wow, must be trash, right? But they go to a tournament like Summit, which features a number of teams that are, in theory, below them or around the level of competing to get into the top 10. So we're talking like big, perhaps optic now. You look at some of these squads, G2, that still has Kenny S and Shocks. They managed to win this tournament without losing a series. Yeah, they lost maps at time to time. Yeah, they had times where people pushed them, but they won the tournament. They didn't have to use the tournament life. They even won a best of five, three, one in the final over optic. They beat all the notable teams that basically they were at the tournament and went deep. They just showcased that they were much better than the rest of the squads there. But then they go to IM Chicago. Do they make some sort of a top finish, top run? No, nope, of course they don't. Just as in the past, when they couldn't make the major, but they won IM Shanghai. Right, let's boost them up a level. Let's see them at DreamHack Stockholm. What's that? Ah, nothing relevant there. No big results. So one of the things I love about this is that you can make the arguments, and obviously analysts would anyway, but the scene itself will take care of it. If they can play three, four tournaments and have big results, then yeah, they're going to be a very good team. They're a legit team. You start to see them get into a position where they look good, like Team Liquid does. They've had the occasional tournament where they bombed it. Remember, they made only top eight at Star Series Season 5 when they lost to NRG. Uh, they also had that result where they were like last place at, at ESL 1 Cologne. But aside from that, the rest of the year has been so fabulous that it's clear their quality. Those one-off results, just as a positive result for someone, an overperformance could be exaggerated for months and months. Imagine if we only had one big tier one international LAN every three months in CS, and that happened to have been ESL Cologne, and everyone's saying, oh, Team Liquid, they need to make player changes. They're not an elite team after all. Like, they show that they can't be that good. Puh, losing to people like North, how fucking good could they be? Well, we've seen how good they can be now when they've had more chances to play these tournaments. This is one of the reasons, it's a side reason as to why I never got the whole oversaturation angle that people push in CS. Like, I get it that people push it because they want to watch all the games and they don't have time or they're not around at this particular time to watch the game live and they don't want to watch the VOD or they just wish they could get a, a keep track of the whole scene in the way they might about the NFL or the NBA or whatever. But the problem is, yeah, if the games suck, yeah, complain about it, but mainly you just complain the games suck. If the games are awesome and you're having amazing matchups again and again, is it really a bad thing that you get to watch all these amazing matchups? No, not really. That's why the oversaturation angle, angle never worked. Because when you have teams that match up really well, so a great example would be in 2016, Virtus Pro and SK slash Luminosity repeatedly matched up. So that it was always three games, or it was always incredible matches, or there was always be like at least one or two maps that were really close and hard fought and really pushed the victor to the limit. So in earlier in the year, it was SK winning. Later in the year, it was VP winning. These are some of the most legendary series we've seen. And it was fabulous. 
fabulous that these teams kept playing because it became a game within a game and what happened in the past series informed what happened in the next one from the pick bans to where at one point in time VP just could not win train against SK VP was a fabulous train team SK then stopped being able to win maps amazingly sometimes like Overpass or Cobblestone could go to Virtus Pro this, this made it a fabulously exciting series and if they'd have only played once you wouldn't have had the same excitement you wouldn't have had the same amplification of the epic nature of their matchup and you wouldn't have had as many great games another aspect that's cool about the very open aspect of the circuit is you get the smaller tournaments as well and at these smaller tournaments you can have a scenario where a team like an NRG, a Mouse Sports, whoever they are, teams that aren't like quite the elite teams, but are very good teams, North, Optic, good teams or bordering on good at times, they might have a decent run, one off a, a big international land. And so if it seemed like a North or an, or an Optic, just to finish top six would be, or top eight would be a nice result for them. But if you then go, right, well, they're clearly like the eighth best team in the world, send them to some of the DreamHack Opens or send them to a smaller star ladder or send them to a land that isn't as massive. And as we've seen this year, they might not win the tournament, even though all the teams there are ranked below them. All the teams there are considered squads that aren't supposed to be as good, wouldn't do as well at the tier one tournament. So even for the sort of medium or lower level, teams this open circuit really shows us who they are as well so what i love about the open circuit aspect and the fact it kills hype trains is it means that when teams don't turn out to be a hype train when they actually turn out to be legit you either get a new top team so a team like nrg can start to enter the ranks and give us a few big performances beyond just one nice performance over the year and we can say yeah they're not a top five top six team but they're getting legit in the top 10 and they're starting to build up to where they might be able to go higher in the future but we don't have to crown them yet when they haven't done it but on the other end of the equation when a team does actually do it and they are very good like the team liquid example you get to see greatness and excellence on a much more meaningful scale than if it was a league format because you're not waiting for the final result at the end of that particular season you're getting it every tournament and then every tournament added to the others and drawing an average through them you can get an idea of where they're at you can look at who they're beating and who they're losing to and how often they're placing the high placings and how often they flunk the tournament and get a very good sense of how good how great how excellent how average how bad a team may be depending on the example so it reminds me of one of my favorite quotes i think it might even be like a camu quote where it's like don't wait for the final job judgment it happens every day like that's how I feel about the open circuit and that's one of the reasons I love the open circuit compared to leagues or closed circuit formats this video was kindly supported by Andreas Snazor Westerland, Dean Tanglis, Gardner Wilson, Landon Thompson, Tobias Bernasconi, Ollie J, Nate D O Double G, Kyla Harris, Travis Greb, Daniel Yordanov, James Harding, Vexi, Robert Baxter, Lucas Kurzer Chesney. And a special thanks, as always, goes out to my man, Jerky's Minion. Do you want to suggest a topic or a guest to feature in my upcoming content? Perhaps you want to ask me a question in my monthly AMA. Do you want teasers from my upcoming content? See who the next guests are going to be. Perhaps you'd like to take part in, in a discussion about esports with me. Well, any and all of the above exclusives are available for my patrons. So put your money where your mouth is and join the Skrilluminati today at the Patreon link below.